Um, we have a good uh, group here. Uh, Travis Uri and uh, Greg Sleepak talking about group income and group currency, but just uh, before we get started, in case somebody wants to have uh, get to know some people, fun people to chat with, you, you know, you want to talk with cool people afterwards. So Martin gave a talk last week on circles, which is which is a specific implementation of uh, basic income on the blockchain. You've got code written for Ethereum. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a great option to talk with. Um, Steve Waldman, raise your hand, wave your hand. He gave a talk introducing the the uh, meat space. What's a better word than meat space? The flesh space. The flesh space uh, <laughs> version of basic income. And uh, uh, Steve blogs at interfluidity.com. Let's see, who else? Anybody here for the very first time? Great. So just tell us your name and your interest in Ethereum, just for fun. Um, so I'm Debian, and like uh, I have an interest like in payment basis because I, you know something of a small society like small group. Okay, very good. Uh, tell me, John Kibel, uh, founder of Start Worldwide Lobby, will focus on crowdsourcing and crowdfunding uh, policy, and. Just looking at Ethereum as a possibility for authenticating voters. Okay, by the way, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to, but if you're willing. Okay, so it's, uh, it's the currency or the group income or the intersection of those two? Okay, very good. My name is Paco. I'm just in the Ethereum as a new way to work. Okay, very good, very good. Excellent. Hi, my name is Arn. Um, I've been passing in this area for years, and actually, before blockchain existed, to my knowledge, I was getting into the software. Now you're putting me in the tools for it, so I'm really excited. To learn about uh, community and community that works this and both. So we do develop the space that I'm busy with in here. Okay. So in our past two meetups, we've had kids here, which is great. So, uh, okay. Anybody else want to briefly express their, I mean, this is again, hopefully the first timers. We're giving the first timers a chance to s express their interest if they'd like to. <clears throat> My name is John, I'm a software engineer. I don't know, I don't know nothing about the tech right now, so I just want to decide. But um, a few years ago, I published a book, which is more along the lines of political economy, which is passing the African, some form of negative income tax, or to no income. And so I'm very excited to see this type of thing. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, so we don't have any further meetups planned. It's, we're kind of impromptu. Um, it takes time to plan meetups, but would love to have one of you suggest something. I, come talk to me if you have an idea. We'd love to work with you on that. Uh, I'll just tell you right up some fun things to talk about. There's lots of technical things that the Ethereum core developers are doing, which would be great to have an introduction on, like uh, this IDE mix, the Solidity language, the browser missed. Uh, they may have changed some of those names. The communications protocol whisper, the storage protocol swarm. Uh, lots of what else am I missing? Core cryptographic things like the uh, the tree, um, the Patricia try or tree. Um, even things like the Lightning Network or 
some very basic thing like the history of money. You know, there's lots of fun things about the history of money which are applicable here. You know, how much is it solely something that comes from the government, or what what makes money worthwhile? What what is money? So I'd love to hear people propose those. Okay, so we have a great last last week. We we had this discussion on uh, basic income, and uh, in the in flush space and on the Ethereum blockchain, we've got more of it tonight from uh, Greg and Travis. So if you have more introduction, you're certainly welcome to do it. But turning over. Can you check and see if we have a microphone? I think the camera can pick us up, right? Uh, if you want a microphone, okay. give it to your right. Okay. okay. Well, we don't have a microphone. I'll just talk. I'll no, here we go. Here we go, right here. If you want it, there it is. Oh, awesome. Let's, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and this thing's going to be facing this way apparently it's the way it wants to face so thank you all for coming my name is greg slepak and this is travis here uh, we're both working in the area of how do you implement basic income just you know if you wanted to be if you wanted to implement basic income yourself and didn't want to wait uh for greg i think you need to hold a little closer yeah. if you want it to actually be yes, useful sir. Yeah, so we're working on voluntary implementations of basic income, uh, basically just groups that can come together and provide themselves with basic income. How do you do that? Turns out that the blockchain is really useful for that. Uh, is that still working, by the way? Working? Yeah. It is still working. Okay, I just need to return it a little bit again. Yeah, you can introduce yourself. Oh, sure. Uh, my name is Travis Urich. Uh, so I'm the co-organizer of the SF Bitcoin Meetup Group, along with Thomas at Bitcoins, who's doing our camera today. Thank you. Uh, I'm also the new moderator at the Bit Panel, which is going to be on Wednesday, and that's going to be over at Hero City. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk, discuss about this topic with Greg. We've been talking about it for a while now, so here we go. Cool, thanks. So I will start with a quick five minute introduction of basic income that I gave at the recent Blockstack Summit at, uh, in New York as kind of a kickoff to this topic. So this slide doesn't actually apply to this meetup. Uh, we do have time to talk about the details of basic income. So first, I'm going to briefly cover some of the motivations for basic income so we understand why we're even here talking about this. And then I will describe, uh, well, then we'll describe two mechanisms. Here I only described one, which was group income. Today we're going to go into a deep dive into both group income and group currency. So once upon a time, we made a promise. We told kids that they could be anything. And for a privileged few, we kept this promise. But for most, we did not. Student loans, debt, disappearing jobs, anxiety due to automation, Etc. I don't remember my peers telling me that they wanted to be homeless or nervous wrecks when they grew up. Um, in the context of basic income, the word handouts is not very appropriate, especially when applied to voluntary approaches. Basic income is not simply a form of welfare. It goes a little bit beyond that. It is something that's given not to a portion of a population, but to everyone equally. So what basic income is about is uh, two things primarily. It's about keeping that promise that we made uh, to our children and the promises that were made to us. And two, it's about the economy, specifically the Star Trek economy and how we're going to get there. Isaac Newton had his nobility to thank for his accomplishments because it afforded him the time and the freedom to be creative instead of having to scrap together an income to pay off his student loans. Johnny stresses a lot 
is too busy worrying about his survival to develop the warp drive. The Star Trek economy is not about scarcity. It is about abundance and integrity. An economy powered by zombies doesn't produce starships, replicators, or teleporters. At best, it produces crappy B-rated films. This is the template photo that came with this uh, PowerPoint theme. It seemed so appropriate for basic income that I decided to keep it. What is basic income? Basic income is the realization of an economy where everybody's basic needs are met unconditionally. And for any basic income scheme to work, there are two requirements that must be met. The first is that there must be sufficient value for the basic income itself. And the second is that we have to stop treating people like shit. In other words, the group has to have a change or the right mindset. Basic income starts with groups. It is these groups that must provide the sufficient value for the basic income to actually work the first requirement. And we're going to be talking about voluntary groups today. I'm going to skip over why voluntary, because it is a bit political. And here we're just going to be talking about the technical stuff. So how can blockchains help? Blockchains provide a way to implement practical, voluntary basic income solutions. And there are two known voluntary mechanisms. Um, the first is called a group currency, and the second is called group income. And I'll hand it over to Travis to quickly describe the basic difference between these two. Yeah, so while I do that, uh, Greg's going to start a whiteboard over here. We're going to try to track the differences between these as we go, and hopefully that'll help during the Q&A. Um, there are really two very distinct difference approaches, but there's ways you can do this. You could either make your own currency, or have groups create their own currency. Um, it's very similar to like Circle's approach. Or you can use an existing currency and just do it through tools and frameworks. So group currency is the one where you make a currency, and group income, we're looking more at applying it to existing currencies. This has a benefit of maybe you can bootstrap a bit quicker. Um, and they have very different feature sets. So actually, interestingly enough, group income could even work on fiat, but you'd kind of sac sacrifice some decentralization. We're mostly focusing on how it's applied to say something like Bitcoin, an existing established digital currency. Yeah, I would do that. So what are we um Okay, so from here on, we're going to first, we're going to switch off of the slides and we'll come back to them when we get to the topic of group income. For now, we're going to do a dive, a deep dive into group currency. And let's go over, let's go over that. So first, the definition of a group currency. A group currency has uh, three requirements that must be fulfilled for it to be considered a group currency and one optional feature. The first is that it must uh, provide identified members uh, with a basic income. And that means that it has to protect against the Sybil attack. The Sybil attack is named after a woman whose name was actually Sybil. Uh, and that was because she had multiple personality disorder. And that's kind of the idea behind the civil attack, is you create multiple identities, and thereby you can take advantage of some resource. In basic income, that would be a huge problem, because for a basic income to work, you have to be able to distribute it to uh, identified members. If there's one person who has multiple identities, they'll be able to get multiple basic incomes, and that's not fair, and that can drain the value that's available for everybody else. So that's a big problem. Uh, that has to be addressed by any basic income scheme, no matter how it's implemented, whether it's implemented on the blockchain or elsewhere. The second, uh, is, or the third rather, is that, this is the optional one actually, is that, it provide, and Travis will talk about this, it provides voting rights over a group fund. And the fourth requirement, uh, or the third requirement, is that it provides adequate means for transparency and accountability. Uh, in this case, that link goes to the wiki page for blockchains, and the reason for that is because we consider blockchain to be a mechanism that does provide adequate means for transparency and accountability. You need that because you have to keep track of all of this value. If you can't keep track of the value that's going through some basic income scheme, you can't know that for sure 
that um, that there isn't some kind of fraud occurring. And this is especially important in the case of group currency. Uh, this is one major difference between the two, is that group currencies are slightly more difficult uh, to ensure that there's no fraud versus group income, which is based solely on income. Group currencies involve the creation of a new currency, so you can kind of think of it as a, uh, as a, as a company. We actually, we mentioned this, is that in a sense, group currency is not a new concept. Traditional companies authenticate the identities of their employees. They provide them with a living wage, give out shares with voting rights, and are required by law to provide financial transparency and accountability. So, okay. so this, it is okay to think of group currencies as establishing more efficient, transparent borderless on fly companies. Perhaps uh, a really accurate way of thinking of what a group currency is, uh, conceptualizing it, is uh, if a modern day company and an old Indian tribe were to marry and have a baby, that would be group currency. It is kind of like a company that has familial relations within it. And that's that mindset shift that is required for a basic income to exist. Because in a family, uh, the relationships are familial. They're not exchange-based as they are in most modern companies. In a company, as soon as you become useless to the company, you're basically fired. And that's it, you know, goodbye. Uh, some companies in some countries, you know, they have severance packages and things along those lines. They're, they treat their employees a little bit nicer. Uh, but generally speaking, they don't treat them as nicely as they do in a family. Remember, a basic income is unconditional. So kind of how there's unconditional love in a family, uh, same concept, the same mindset switch is required for a basic income to exist in a group currency. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's not possible for you to lose your basic income. In a group, in a group currency, it's still possible, just as, the, as it is in a family, uh, to lose your basic income. But you have to do something really bad, basically equivalent to whatever is required for your family to disown you or for an old Indian tribe to kick you out. So I think, I think we're ready now to talk a little bit about group funds and their usefulness. So I'll put this up and I'll hand it over to Travis to discuss that. Yeah, so this kind of dovetails off the idea of the mindset switch. Not only in mindset, you also need value. So in this community, in this group, uh, you know, we're, we're minting a coin, but there's a concern. And this is what, this is an optional idea to kind of address this occurrence of concern. And that is, this is a system that has to be managed, you know, maintained, maybe improved upon time, developer resources. So the idea is that you could actually have some of the, you know, minted currency going into a group fund. And in the company example that Greg said, there's voting rights. And that was a mechanism that doesn't really necessarily have until you introduce a group fund. And what you would do is each member would have a vote over what happens with the group fund. So you could have sort of like a budget, you can allocate resources. We're gonna put you know, 20% into development resources. We're gonna put some money into a public works project. We're gonna improve, you know, we're gonna build renewable energy. We're going to build housing. We're gonna have an uh, education center, you know, where people can learn and support the community, et cetera. So this sort of enters and brings in a voting rights capacity as well as um, helps expand hopefully upon the mindset and the community element um, inside of your group. And uh, we have actually some community examples that we can go through as well. Uh, Greg, did you have those up? Yeah. Uh, so they're a lot clearer once you see the maybe examples, hopefully. We'll do a QA on group currency as soon as we cover this. Yeah, one thing I forgot to cover, uh, and I guess it ties in nicely to this examples thing, is kind of, you know, how do you get a, a basic income? So remember I said that for any basic income scheme to work, there has to be sufficient value uh, for a group. You know, whether you implement basic income in the real world or whether you implement it on the digital world, there has to be sufficient value. What do I mean by value? Well, uh, value is actually, this is a good Q&A or question for the audience. Uh, who here has a good definition of what value means? Back there, you. Physical kilowatt hour equivalents, something that can be meaningfully exchanged in physical reality. I mean, you could extend it to artistic experiences and whatnot, but basically it's still what our products and then human services, which are products of education, skillful activity, which are harder to quantify. But I'd say that those are the Okay, I, I have never heard of a kilowatt hour being used to describe value, but I have heard of goods and services. And that is being, I guess, yeah, in Bitcoin, kilowatt hours are kind of the security that gives Bitcoin. Uh, anyone else want to give their definition of uh, that? I would say that the battery is something that can be bought. 
value is something that has demand. OK, yeah. Um, that's actually a really good way of putting it, I think, a really succinct way. Value is something that is valuable to someone or something, uh, to people, and that's demand. And different groups will value the same thing differently. So, uh, and that gives kind of like, you know, in the market, the range of prices that you might find for any particular, you know, uh, service or good. So these groups, when I say they ha must have sufficient value, I mean that the members of the groups have to be creating something, or they have to have something in their possession that is valuable. And it, using that, they provide themselves with a basic income. So here we enter one of uh, the big differences between group income and group currency. Group currency has this really neat feature that isn't in the sort of basic implementation of group uh, income, it isn't available. It's this ability to have a token that can be used for investment purposes. This is one of the reasons why uh, group currency was created, was to figure out, you know, without having, without someone having to go to Kickstarter and sort of crowdfund, without having somebody to go to venture capitalists and pitch their idea, how can we get valuable things into the world and have them, you know, uh, monetized, basically? So one big problem that was a motivation for group, uh, group currency was this privacy conscious developers. You know, one thing that privacy conscious developers who work on things like GPG, you know, securing online communications, that they were having, there was this one developer who, um, it was in the news a few months ago that he nearly went bankrupt. Uh, he, was, he was nearly on the streets. He, and, and he was the core developer for GPG. Uh, and yes, SSL, there was another one for SSL, that was another big problem. There's actually multiple core infrastructure technologies that were not, uh, the core developers for these things were really struggling because they couldn't monetize it. So how can we, how can we help them extract the value of what they're doing so that they continue doing those good things? Because, you know, all of the security of the internet depends on them. It was only after somebody uh, wrote an article and it went viral did this person get a bunch of donations from companies and whatnot. For a long time, they were really struggling. So for example, you can create, uh, you can have a group of privacy conscious developers come together and create a group currency among themselves called like, I don't know, privacy coin. And they'll say, okay, we've got this guy here who can't monetize his thing, but we've got these applications that depend on his technology that we can monetize. So thank you, GPG developer. We're gonna take your technology, include you in our group, that's gonna add value to what we're doing. And then on top of your technology, we're going to create some kind of chat application like Twitter or whatever, and we're gonna to charge tokens for it. And we can even, we don't even have to do this right now. We can just announce our intention and plan to do this. And then we can have a crowdfund uh, based on this and sell these tokens with the assumption, you know, we'll have like a business plan. And just like uh, companies get investment today where they get money in exchange for equity here, it's the same exact situation. You can think of these tokens as equity in this group that's being created. And they'll say that, okay, in the future, the app is gonna work like this. Want to send secure messages longer than X characters to more than Y members? Z tokens will make that possible. Another example are student researchers or professors who uh, can finance their operations. So there's a big problem right now in academia where you've got huge supply of academics, or rather, sorry, well, yeah, I guess huge supply of academics and very little supply of funding, and they're all kind of having to chase after this funding. And then, you know, some of these organizations like NIH might have a quota for the year uh, for how much funding they give out. And some academic who's got the cure for, you know, some, for cancer or whatever, uh, gets his paper in late and sorry, you've missed the quota. Well, you know, that, that kind of problem can be addressed by the creation of an academic coin where a bunch of academics get together and just say, we're valuable individuals, we produce things of real value, and we can monetize that without having to rely on some external third party. We can create academic coin and we can uh, use these tokens and charge for early access to research results, for example. We can use them uh, to charge for our time as consultants, an hourly rate. 
you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then Travis uh, can talk about later on, you know, how a town and city can, can do that. You want to actually talk about that? Uh, that's group picture. Yeah. So as you can see, well, these are different examples. There's a lot of different tokens involved. You know, it's the idea that you you know create a token for your community and what you're working on, um, and that also extends to region as well. You can just have, say, uh, the Bay Area, for instance, or uh, Mountain View. Uh, you can create a token, and based on how successful that region is, you know, with community, the people in that you know community are, it, it represents its value. Um, but the concern might be then is all these different tokens are going on. So a big element would be a centralized exchange of some sort, of course. And then it just becomes how groups value each other, how they group, how the groups value different tokens. And if you have you know, a centralized exchange going, you don't really need to worry about you know how oh, I got to pay this and this. I got to pay academics and academic tokens. I got to use Mountain View coin and Mountain View. I got to use San Francisco coin in San Francisco, and and all the different constantly changing value. You can you know, very easily make a decentralized exchange, ideally, that you know, can help balance between all these different um, communities and groups and currencies. We were thinking that we could do a quick QA on group currency before we go into group income. Yeah, actually, can I say a quick Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the decentralized exchange, so you know, well, what, what is the use of these exchanges? Like, like Travis was saying, there's this problem that, and then we have an FAQ point actually here, is that right. you know, uh, go to groupcurrency.org at some point in time and read this FAQ. So you know, the example of academic coin goes into detail and talks about, for example, what is the purpose of having many currencies? We also talk about, um, you know, will it be a hassle to hold many different currencies? And this, this example you know, addresses that question of how decentralized exchanges, or even centralized exchanges, but preferably decentralized exchanges, can address that problem. Uh, so, in other words, the problem that is, uh, is that I'm an academic. I'm creating these tokens, these academic coins. Paid an academic coin. I'm getting paid an academic coin, but nobody has academic coins. You know? So I say, well, my time is worth 100 academic coins. And I say, well, okay, that's what I'm charging with it. You know, I, I can't say that to an actual person. Uh, or likewise, if I have a storefront on, you know, where I'm selling cupcakes for cupcake coins, I can't actually ask people to pay me in cupcake coins because they don't have cupcake coins. So how is this going to work? Uh, so it's actually possible to make this work seamlessly, to make it appear just like today's system. You can, uh, you know, it's possible to create a technology whereby everyone sees prices in their favorite currency of choice, be that dollars, euros, or bitcoins, or anything else. And the way that it works is like this. So imagine you have a web browser that's got this nice fancy technology built into it. It's kind of aware of these different currencies. And it's aware of decentralized exchanges. And it's aware of the fact that you've got you know, uh, $1,000 in your browser wallet. So when you go to the academic website and you want early access to a paper, it'll be out you know, free uh, in a month. But if you want it now, um, because you want to stay ahead of the game or something like that, you could pay for it. Your browser will show you the prices in dollars, since that's your favorite currency. You pay with dollars. In the background, your browser does some magic. It goes and it says, OK, this guy's charging for this thing in academic coins. How do I get academic coins? Well, there's an exchange rate. Uh, and it might even involve multiple exchanges. It might not be possible to go from dollars to academic coins. But I can find a path to academic coins. You know, I need to pay 100 academic coins, so I've got to buy 100 academic coins. I can buy bitcoins first, so I take my dollars, exchange them for bitcoins, and then there's a path. Uh, Somebody willing to sell me some academic coins. Who? The academics. So where are these tokens being created from? They're being created by the academics themselves. Or this is one thing that I didn't mention. That this is how this thing actually provides a basic income. So the academics, there's a thousand of them, are charging in academic coins. Every single academic uh, let's say every day is creating a thousand of these academic points. And they are backed by the value of, of the group, whatever they're charging. So every day, these academics are going to the exchanges and they're selling their academic points to people. So when you want early access to that paper, you go to the exchange, you give them bitcoins for academic coins or dollars for academic coins. Then you have your hundred academic coins, your browser does. And then you just give back to them. So, you know, 
they sold it, they, they received uh, bitcoins. So they received like, you know, uh, they sold 100 academic coins uh, for 100 bitcoins, so that's, that's quite a lot, uh, <laughs> for like one bitcoin or something like that. They received uh, their bitcoin. And now somebody out there has academic coins, and you know, they can hold on to them if they think the value of academic coin will go up. Or they can immediately turn around and give it back to this guy's store fund. And then in exchange, that person gets access to whatever it is they run, in this case, the paper. Uh, so that's, that's the idea of how uh, group currency provides people with a basic income, is that the rate at which members are selling the coins they are creating has to equal whatever the basic income for that group is. Uh, you know, if they say, if they decide, I see you, you have a question, do you, do you have a question? I did, I just, um, I'm hoping, uh, I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the mechanism of the why, for, for those professors, why they wouldn't just sell their early access for cash? Like, it's, it's, I understand your NIH example and their liquidity issues, and I can understand why they can't access money from that channel. But if there are, there's a question of whether. Oh, they can't. No, no. Okay. They totally can sell it for cash. The point is, how do we provide these people with a basic income? And there's two mechanisms. One is group currency. They can do it through a currency, the creation of a token. Another one is group income. They can do it totally directly with dollars, and we'll talk about that as well, how they can do that. At a, at a fundamental level, the question, though, and this is, I'm sort of with you in, in principle, the question is, is there value in these things that is monetizable but cannot be, cannot be, you know, cannot generate cash compensation? Right, so there's value that, that would be monetized in academic points, mm -hmm. but we cannot monetizing US dollars. Yeah, so there can be situations where what a group is selling, you could, you know, it's a product, it's a good a service, you want to sell it. I think the idea is, behind it, is you want to make your community valuable. Uh, since as being a member of the community, you're, you're essentially, you know, getting a certain number of coins each day, you know, like that's how the mining process works. You're a member of the community, you're getting a certain number of coins. Um, those coins need to be worth something. So if you back it by whatever output or economic capacity your group has, you can, yeah, you could just sell the goods if you wanted to, or if you did this, you could end up creating a value for your tokens itself, and that could be maybe more of a robust economic solution. You know, actually have a community where they have, they're getting paid for their work. Uh, yeah, I mentioned I mentioned group fund. Because I think I think that's another. Yeah, thing. since 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 this the currency is now creating value, you can you know have a group fund, you can vote on it. I mean, reinvest in the group. Yeah, yeah. Does that does that answer? It, it does. I think it, it's sort of abstract right now, but it would be interesting to see a model that shows like what, how much value is generated within that group in the mm -hmm. cash economy versus the the academic coin economy. Like, are you are you are you more productive in that economy? Are you able to do more research in that economy? How that looks? Do you have an answer? Yeah, maybe one one short uh, answer to this. There's there's a professor of Jana Vietar, and he's promoting uh, additional currencies. Okay. And he kind of made the proof um, how especially like, so you could in theory convert everything to dollar and then every time you have to dollar amount. But the the advantage of it is especially uh, the floating exchange rates between uh, different different currencies. So uh, that's that's one big point. And um, especially you can link two unused resources together with with a currency. Uh, so there have been these examples of. Um, of a town uh, that um, creates a new currency, and for this currency you can uh, ride ride to the bus, and therefore you, uh, as a, and with this currency you can also buy some of. Um, or, no, no, no. You you, you get this currency by um, by cleaning up the streets and, and uh, removing rubbish, and and what you can do with this currency is ride to local local transportation system. And if they if they could not do this dollars because they, they don't have any dollars, right. they only have free space in the transportation system. So that's really well where they kind of benefit. Yeah, that, that's like benefit there. I mean with dollars you need to have the dollars, but if you're creating value for your own currency, then you could like do you link it to your resource that you where you have more Yeah, you could say like your example was, you know, you can earn some of the community coin by cleaning up the streets and helping out and that adds value to the community, so it's not like a, it's not like you know inflation because you're printing this coin. You're able to kind of make your own currency, you're able to you know add value to the community and pay through it. Uh, and I think 
So in, another way of maybe rephrasing your question is, you know, why aren't they just using dollars? Well, um, in the real world, forget about blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Does everybody in the world use dollars it's for everything? No, they don't. Uh, why don't companies, you know, forget about all of their shares and just use dollars and just hold on to cash? So, so that, that kind of I think answers your question. That people have uh, oftentimes very good reasons for creating uh, their own token, and the stock market uh, and shares is a great example of that. Where you know. Whatever reasons they have for creating and distributing shares, that's the, those are the same exact reasons why they would want to create a group currency. And or, for example, if a government wants to create its own uh, currency, whatever reasons they have for not using dollars, those are the same reasons why they might want to have uh, their own token. And usually, it's kind of about the alignment of the group's interests with the token. So dollars are created by the U.S. government, and uh, they are distributed. In you know whatever way the, the distribution actually favors some subset of the population, and they decide kind of like you know uh, certain central banks get the dollars first and they're able to extract value from it. They're able to do you know various different things. Uh, the government has the sole rights to print more dollars. They have the sole rights to burn dollars, and likewise companies. Uh, you could more, yeah, yeah. If you could issue more stock, and if your company is still valuable, if that's okay, then you know the value holds and you're all right. Or if you're another com country and you decide not to use dollars and use your own currency for the same reason, you can issue your own, and as long as you're still productive and economically viable, it holds its value, it's okay. So if your community is doing something like you, you pay people to clean up, you give them your token, it's still adding value to the community, it's making a nicer place, so it still holds its value. And you let the community kind of like explore its kind of value creation in itself. As opposed to dollars, which more kind of a zero sum, it's what's available, what you have. Yeah. We have a question in the event? As a business guy, I look at the whole concept of token. Get lost very quickly why I need 18 million different iterations of token. It seems to me that fundamentally we're, we're tying a current rate and a future rate to some measurement, and it's going to vary over time. It's not really the right now. But if we keep the token separate from the dollar or the yen or whatever it is, why can we not simply embrace some non um, the problem I have with Bitcoin is it's speculative and it's an investment in the form of trying to gain the system, if you will, perhaps. We'll go there. But why can't I just have a single token and simply tie my rate to that at some exchange point? And if my investment increases, suddenly it's not worth a thousand tokens anymore, it's not worth five thousand tokens. But why do I have to have so many different tokens? Um, is it because I want my name on it and I feel cool, or is it because it really serves the purpose? So I'll just repeat the question in case that the camera didn't pick it up. You're saying instead of having all these different tokens, why not have like a singular money and <coughs> a, a, a rate, of, you know, pegging each one to a rate for each community? Um, and I can start with Greg by us more. My, my first answer to that would be that it's the ability to kind of issue your own tokens. It's sort of this, you know, this ability to kind of like control your money supply. Um, you can, you know, produce more as you produce more economic value, and as your community becomes more valuable, you can kind of like issue and control the supply of tokens. It may be a very different mechanism than just trying to control a rate. Uh, but I mean, Greg, if you yeah, this goes off of uh, it's basically the same answer that I was uh, giving earlier. Uh, you, the, the question is equivalent to why does anybody have or hold uh, or distribute shares of Apple? You know, or for example, why does Apple have shares at all? You know, why don't they use Microsoft shares to represent Apple's value, or why don't they just get rid of it? But but like every company just totally get rid of their shares and just hold dollars instead. Uh, they could do that, but they don't, and the reason is they have good reasons for that. And you know, uh, and, and you can look at what those reasons are. And they're not the same. They differ from group to group, and. But the overarching general thing that's common among all of them, and remember, dollars are tokens, and they're not special at all. They're just, they're, the only thing that they're special in is that they're kind of used as a reserve currency, which means that they're this go-between currency between many other different tokens. Um, and likewise, Bitcoin is very valuable as a reserve currency in cryptocurrencies. Uh, when I was talking about academic coins, there might not be an easy way to exchange between dollars and academic coins, but if you go, but there is an easier way, a path through dollars to bitcoins, 
to academic coins or from academic coins to turtle coins. You would go through. Guys, it is an Ethereum meetup after all. Why don't we use the Ether as our Oh, yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Let's tie this on to uh, Ethereum. How does this work? Well, Ethereum is wonderful because it's actually perfectly suited for the creation of group currencies. Ethereum, one of the main reasons Ethereum was designed was to make it simple for anyone to create a token in a secure way. Uh, and that's what Ethereum is perfectly suited for. Bitcoin isn't as good at that uh, as Ethereum is. And the reserve currency in Ethereum is Ether. So if you want to convert between one token you create on Ethereum to another token, you go through Ether. Uh, and that's where it derives its value from. Um, we, should, we should start wrapping up the group currency. There's, only a, there's a mechanism for this that exists as opposed to the, the sort of indexing idea you were discussing. But uh, I think we're going to move on to group income really quick. And we'll have a larger QA at the end. So. Maybe you could just briefly at least mention circles. So you have a sentence or two to say on circles. Actually, why don't, Martin, you should come up here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. circles be an example of a group currency. Yeah, circles is, okay. is an example, is an implementation, and we have it listed on the on the right. website. Yeah, it's we, right here. Oh, so, yeah. uh, we we have a few implementations of a group currency that we didn't make. Other people made it, and Martin is one of the implementers of uh, one such thing that fits the definition of group currency. If you can just briefly talk about circles. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess the presentation two weeks ago, uh, circles is yeah uh, implementation of, of group currency. Um, it, it it runs on Ethereum. Uh, the core idea is that um, that everyone starts as an individual and has in the beginning just issues its own tokens and it, it's its own coin. And I think one one important idea is that you uh, kind of give away some of the control of it. So uh, I would say if you always have the, the option to to uh, to generate unlimited amount of tokens in the future, then it's questionable whether or not this will be valuable. So in circles, I came up with the idea that that um, you just register an account, and from this uh, this point on, uh, the issuance of token is for every person the same. It's just uh, constant and has a growth rate of two percent or something uh, per year. And, um, and then, um, after this first step, uh, people can form groups, and forming, forming a group means that you kind of agree that within your group, um, all, all, your, uh, all your single currencies um, have a one-to-one -one exchange rate, so they kind of forming a, um, um, how do you call it, currency group, no, a currency union or uh, something, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, and just to be clear, the statement up there is no longer correct. It actually is implemented. It says up there that circles is not implemented. Is that correct? It is. It is. I mean, I mean, I, I have written code, and it's it's on the way. So it, it's it's the it's the correct. I mean, I'm 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 working on it. Uh, we, there's still a ways to go between. Uh, you know, any random person can just join circles. There's there's still work to be done for okay, that. Okay. Well, as far as I understand, there's uh, you know. I this is maybe, maybe the best chance if you want hardcore examples of what's yeah. code for a, a group currency. Is that correct? Yeah, I've, I've written the code, the contract code for Ethereum, but it needs a lot of lot of code more than. Okay. Yeah, and Circles Circles has a website. So if you go to groupcurrency.org and you click on the word circles, you'll go to uh, Martin's about circles.org. I think is the website, and he's got a community uh, page there. Yeah, that's it's a great project. Uh, Ucoin is another uh, project with, uh, with developers from France who are working on um, a basic income cryptocurrency. We're going to move on now because we're out of time uh, talking about uh, this. So I'm going to quickly go and quickly describe the mechanisms of group income. Or did you want to say something? Yeah, so this is going to be uh, quite different. Again, the goal is still basic income, but uh, the way group income goes about doing it is very different. Uh, so Greg's getting the slides ready now. Yeah, I got you. Okay, welcome, welcome guys. Uh, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We talked about group currency, and now we're gonna talk about group income. And the difference between the two of them, again, is that one involves the creation of a new token, the group decides to create a new token. That gives them some, uh, it's, it's nice for some groups, and for others it might not be, others might prefer to do group, in, group income instead. The ability to create your own token makes it a little easier to receive outside investment and 
to kind of reinvest back into your, your group with the group fund and all of that. But it's also a little cumbersome. Group income, because it doesn't involve the creation of a new token, you can use existing, you know, uh, any, you can use dollars even. Um, this, is, this is how it works. So the value is represented by the income streams that come into a group. You again have to start off with a group. And the reason why you start off with a group uh, in, in, these, in these schemes is because usually it's you know, not the case that an individual can provide themselves with a basic income for you know, most people. Some, some people can, some people can't. Some people can easily monetize things, other people cannot. But there are people who, and that, that, that's an important point actually, um, that, that we should spend some time on, is that in society in general, um, everybody's doing something important, but not everybody is able to extract uh, monetary, uh, is not able to monetize that. So, you know, a, a nice like example. GPG guy. Yeah, like, like the GPG guy, exactly. Yeah. But when you combine it with a group, uh, suddenly the group is able to benefit from that value. A really simple one that a lot of people, it comes to a lot of people's minds when I mention this, is uh, stay-at-home moms. You know, it would be a really terrible world if mothers were forced to monetize their children. Thankfully, we don't exist in such a world. They do a whole lot of uh, work. They do legitimate work, and they create legitimate value. They're not able to monetize it, and we don't want them to monetize it. Um, but because they create a group, a union, uh, you know, in our society, it's usually a union of just two people. In other societies, it can be larger, kind of like a tribe. Um, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Another example are meetup groups like this one. And the people who, like Tom, uh, help us out by live streaming this to the internet. The function that Tom is performing right now is highly valuable. But it's super difficult for him to monetize it. And I know another guy uh, uh, who uh, was helping Ryan, who, who was helping monetize, uh, sorry, not monetize, he was helping live stream the San Francisco Bitcoin uh, meetups. And that group, the, and everybody in that group benefited so greatly uh, from the work that he was doing for free. He told me that anytime he tried to charge for his work, the meetup organizer said, sorry, can't afford it. But he felt that it was so important to share this information with the world that he would do it for free, bring his professional equipment, and stream all this stuff to the to the world online. Everybody in the San Francisco basic income, uh, sorry, the San Francisco Bitcoin uh, group, benefited from that, uh, including all of the companies whose products were then streamed to the internet. They kind of benefited from the free advertising from that. But he did not get compensated for that value that he created. So that's another area. Uh, it's important to compensate these people. That's another reason why you know these groups are important and why basic income is important because everybody's value ends up getting maximized. So yeah, let's move along. So in a group uh, income scheme, there's a group that has income coming in to this group address. So this group address on Ethereum, for example, would be would be an Ethereum group address. And the reason why it works this way is because. As income goes into the group, it's tagged with the name of the person who generated it. So this could be dollars, this could be bitcoins, uh, this could be anything. And the basic idea of group income is the following. Imagine everybody has, you know, in front of them, uh, the metaphor I like to use is, you know, water or jug with water coming in. So the arrow that's coming into the group is uh, this stream of water that's being generated by the group, you know, which represents the income. And everybody has a jug that starts out empty at the month. And this jug represents the amount of value that it takes to provide a person with a basic income. So, um, three minutes, okay, yeah. so here we have one person who got paid. When a person is paid, that income goes directly to filling their jug. Their basic income allotment for the month. Uh, here, somebody else was able to, you know, maybe they had a good uh, sales day, they sold several cars, and they were able to fill up their basic income jug completely. But in addition to that, they were actually able to help uh, 
they, they, got, they got more uh, funds. When your basic income allotment for the month uh, has been filled, any additional income that you generate goes to helping the entire group fill up their basic, their, their jars, their basic income allotments uh, of the month. So this person uh, made uh, extra money and he helped fill several other people's jars. And this continues until everybody's jar is full. Uh, so what happens if you know the month isn't over yet and you get even more money? Well, in that case, you get an extra jar and that just goes directly to you. Oh, and yeah, actually, why don't we do this uh, recap from the start of the presentation. Timmy is suffering unnecessarily. Timmy needs his freedom so that he can invent the warp drive. Basic income gives him this freedom. Without basic income, we risk losing Timmy to the zombies as well as his contributions. Timmy's extended family slash tribe can provide him with the basic income as long as there is sufficient value in the group. The last slide was talking about this meetup and whatnot. So let's, let's move back. So when the jugs are being filled up, one of the, one of the things we have to figure out on group uh, income is some sort of method of ensuring fairness over time. And some of them, maybe they just get paid earlier and you're sort of like incentivizing to hold back your income, let somebody else pay sooner. And maybe like, you know, somebody does really well for a while, like you have a couple, six months, they have a lot of sales, but they're more of a seasonal worker. And then the rest of the year, you know, they're not. And we want to find a way of, of kind of making sure that, you know, there's at least some fairness going on in this jug filling mechanism. So one of the things we have to work on and that we're looking at right now is we have sort of two different ideas currently on how to, how to do this. One of them is just sort of a tracking system, which I think I would probably go into pretty well. And another one involves sort of bonds. I like to kind of think of it as municipal bonds. Um, so, uh, Greg, do you want to do tracking system first? Sure. All right. Okay. What's that? The abridged version. The abridged version, yeah. yeah. So, we originally were thinking of calling it as a debt tracking system, but we decided that yeah. that's inappropriate because, uh, remember, there are people in the group who are providing legitimate value to the group. Uh, but they're not able to monetize. And when you throw in the word debt, you actually create a lot of psychological harm on that person because they are providing value, but they're not able to pay it back with an income. Uh, so we're just calling it a tracking system. This tracking system is useful for the people who actually are able to monetize their work. Uh, it's kind of like a fairness check. You know, you could exa imagine a situation where a group has somebody who's paid four times a year in large installments and somebody else who's paid several times a month Etc. Now, how do you deal with this? So, we have our group here. And we have a person here. So let's let's create a group with just for simplicity's sake three people. And uh, uh, why not just turn these into jugs? That's all people are. That's all people are. Just big bottles of water. <laughs> so, uh, what was that quote from? Uh, Movie with the crazy guy Stanley Kubrick you know, to preserve the integrity of our bodily fluids or something like that. You guys know what I'm talking about? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Dr. 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 Strangely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's say that this jug gets filled completely by this person. Let's call this person A. And they help fill up this amount of. Uh, so this is actually going into the actual algorithm of how we do this tracking system, and it will be implemented in Ethereum code. As uh, this income, you know, goes to this person, they filled it up, it goes to these people, etc. It goes into this job. This person, A, uh, gets a... We kind of say that they're owed by the group. Let's say that they put in $50 here and $50 here. Uh, the group, at that point, owes this person we, say, we, say, we don't say any individual owes this person, we, uh, owes A. We say that the group owes a hundred dollars and then we put a uh, a tracker a tracker i'm not going to call it that a tracker on these people so if this person owes the group again not a but the group fifty dollars and so does this person owes um them fifty dollars and so in the future when let's say b gets income that in, the algorithm always prioritizes basic income over debts. So, so you know, let's say they were able to uh, fill up their basic income all of the way. 
and they were able to get in more. Normally, without this uh, tracker, they would get another jug and the, the money would go directly to them. But since they have this $50, I'm just gonna call it a debt, since they have this $50 debt that they owe the group, it goes to paying back that debt first before they get a new jug. And the algorithm looks at who is owed by the group. This person is owed the most by the group, so it goes to this person. So let's say they uh, filled up their, their thing and they got an extra $50, you know, their debt is canceled, and this guy is now no longer owed $100 by the group, he's now owed $50 by the group. So, you know, that, and that's the basic idea behind that mechanism and how it keeps everything fair for the people who are actually uh, generating the income. And it's perfectly fine, again, for somebody out here to have this tracker say that they owe the group, you know, a million dollars. As long as this person is actually, you know, a good person, helping out the group, providing value to the group, uh, it's totally fine. Uh, yes, we have a question. So, uh, simple one. Uh, um, in tax assembly, they share broadly, everyone has a pretty good quality of life. Are there analogies here if we kind of take this out to a broader scale, or is the idea here that we do it at a micro scale, much like what these other economies are doing? Yeah, I think the idea here is that we can we can try to implement this, you know, uh, it may be very hard to get policy, it may be very hard to get like, a large scale change, but if we make the correct tools and make the code, we could just try it out ourselves. Like, hey, let's do an experiment. Let's do a group with us. And everyone in this room signs up with the group. And we could do that. If the tool existed, we could do it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, along the same lines, the same question, but at a somewhat smaller scale, do you know of any place such as Bilbao, like there's a famous workers cooperative enterprise in Bilbao, Spain. Do you know if they happen to organize any sort of policy like this in any sense? I'm not familiar with the Greg. No clue. The thing is, is that, well, this policy specifically, you can kind of see how this can be implemented uh, without a blockchain, just with dollars and like an accountant. Uh, you could totally do that. Yeah. Maybe somebody's doing something along these lines. And I've actually heard some people mention that different groups, maybe like there are some, I have, I have heard, I, I do think that something along these lines does exist in the world. It's just called by a different name, but sorry, I don't know what it's called. Yeah, I think I've heard something, uh, um Usually, it's running around churches in South America, and then somebody's telling me. Actually, Evelyn was telling me about a, a Japanese version of it as well. Um, we weren't yeah. showing the details. Well, well there's more of a group fund. Like a group fund idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Like okay. Yeah. 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 Y
with the rate of keeping money versus paying off existing bonds. What I really like about this is what could really help a group like this is outside investment. You know, somebody who wants to help make this group prof, you know, prosperous, somebody who believes in what they're doing, or in this regional area, for instance, say you're worried about overpopulation in San Francisco, so you want to kind of encourage the building of better communities in the East Bay, South Bay, North Bay, et cetera. So you can take kind of the capital of San Francisco and maybe invest in these other regions. So I, I don't want an entirely separate mechanism for that. So what's nice about this is you could have outside investors use the same mechanism. They could actually be the ones who kind of, you know, give money into the system and they get a bond. And now they're, they're investors at this point. They, if they think in the long run, this means to be very successful, they're not worried. They'll, they'll get their interest rates, they'll get their bond terms and they'll get paid back. If they start losing faith in that, they can sell it, you know, 80 cents a dollar or, or 50 cents on the dollar to somebody who still believes in the community and they can exit their risk. They can manage their risk. Uh, also, if you have these external people at play, you can buy up all the bonds that are held by everybody inside the group so everyone has their money in their pool and their kosher, and uh, you take the risk outside to investors, which is where the risk should be anyways. And this actually kind of leads into something that we're calling friendly imperialism, um, because we couldn't really think of a, and maybe an economic, an economic system here can think of an existing term this is used, we can think of a situation where like an outside uh, entity is positively um, sort of you know trying to run or control or, or help out. Uh, you want to say something? Yeah, I just I just want to say a, a real quick intro uh, yeah. to friendly imperialism, and then we'll hand it back to Travis to really describe it. Uh, because I really like talking about Star Trek. Uh, We're going on a Star Trek binge. We just recently oh, yeah, Star Trek DS9, course, yeah. and yeah. So okay, in Star Trek, guess yeah, where yeah. the headquarters of Starfleet is. San Francisco, that's yes, right. that's right, okay. So that might actually be reality at some point because San Francisco is this super, extremely highly capitalized area. Economic, 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 economic yeah, yeah, it's an economic the entire region around it, yeah. And there we, we were talking about San Francisco and we were thinking about, well, you know, in the context of basic income, we realized we cannot provide a basic income in San Francisco. It doesn't make sense. To provide, there, there are actually some scenarios and some situations where you cannot economically provide a basic income. Uh, one of those is when you don't have enough value to provide a, a basic income. But kind of like a flip side of that is when you have this supply demand issue, like in San Francisco, you do with housing. Yeah. There's too little supply of housing. There's too much demand for uh, housing. So if you give people money, that money is going to go directly to housing. The prices will just go up. You're not going to really. The people will not, won't be able to use that money for anything else but housing. You, you haven't really income. changed anything, but just increased the prices of housing. You could have basic income but still be living on the streets just because there is no housing available. And if, you're, if your basic income is limited to the fact you're in the San Francisco group, well, yeah, I'm going to leave San Francisco. You lose your basic income. So a better option would be if San Francisco could somehow like take its economic value and invest in the basic incomes of the cities around it, or even eventually larger and wider. So like in the the, the head, start for headquarters example, it could be that's that's how that happened. You know, the, the friendly imperialism, uh, San Francisco became the economic driver of the communities around it, the region, et cetera. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, so there was this bonds idea that Travis was just talking about, and friendly imperialism maybe can work with bonds, but in a, another way, the way that we originally conceptualized uh, friendly imperialism was actually through kind of a, a kind of like equity stake in the future income of outside communities. So San Francisco would provide some small town uh, a basic income through this group income scheme. And, you know, Go ahead. Describe it. <laughs> well, you need two mics. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of like beautiful little towns up north, or if you go farther east, and they're losing their population because there's you know there's no jobs, and there's plenty of space there. But everyone's moving to the city. This is a trend. Everyone's going into the cities. So if you could kind of take San Francisco, and because it can't and it can't take them in anyways, and as for, instead of creating social programs to kind of try to support this excess population that's just not going to work out, it could like you know invest in those other communities. They will give you a bunch of money. You build up your infrastructure. You build up towns. Build up jobs. And then down the line, you can pay us back. And that's all in our, our terms or our contract, uh, or our relationship between groups, essentially. So you could, it could just be huh? using the arrow now. Yeah. So, straight. like, what's nice about this is, you, it, again, it's not an extra mechanism. You could just make it a group relationship. So you have different groups, and their arrow, they are, where they're getting their funds from, where this relationship is, uh, is, you know, in this case, our friendly imperialism. Yeah. So this, this goes to the investors. Yeah. So some of that automatically goes back to the investors or is put into a fund to pay them back in the future, and then the rest can go to uh, 
you know, infrastructure, the kinds of things that those investors want in order to create a successful return on their investment. I feel like we skipped over something earlier. Or is that is that it? Um, as far as the, the friendly imperialism, I think that, or, or yeah, I feel like we skipped over something on friendly imperialism. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's good. Yeah. Oh, we have a question about it. Take questions. It's all right. Yeah. 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 Well, while, while he's looking at the notes, I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay. Internet. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, I think we can do questions at this point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there was. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, my. Uh, anybody else have questions? I can go later, please. Yes. I can go. I can go. You, you, you were nodding. You were nodding the whole time. Yeah. So I want to hear what you say. Yeah. Um, this may be a corner case, but. It, you know, value creation within the group or by an individual within the group obviously leads to an increase in filling these bottles, et cetera. It benefits everybody. I understand all that. What happens in a situation where you have a bad beat or an indigent? Oh, that is always the first question. Yes. <laughs> or, even worse, I thought, what if you have a whole group who are a bunch of dead people? Oh yeah. Hey, other groups will support us. We need to do anything. Yeah, yeah. This is okay. Okay. So the question is. Okay, okay. This is this is so funny. It's always the number one question I get after describing this mechanism. Um, so it's definitely going to be the number one question. Yeah, I will. I will on, on the Group Income website. Uh, GroupIncome.org is where we're gonna we'll flesh it out with information just as we did for group currency, and we'll describe this there. The question is, what do you do with, uh, I think the term he used was deadbeats, uh, indigents, yeah, uh, or another term that people like to use are freeloaders. Uh, what, what do you do about those if you have them in a group? And just to be clear, it could be voluntary or involuntary, right? I mean, you have a whole group, but they voluntarily decide to be free. Involuntary guy, or voluntary, excuse me, who's like, I'm working, 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 I'm but he's capable. Yeah. But he still doesn't do it. That's one case. And the other is an elderly person who really can't do very much. Right. 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 So she can't earn. Yeah. Money. Okay. Yeah. So, so he's, he, uh, for, for the people online who uh, couldn't hear that, he's talking about how, uh, in, in the sense of like somebody who's a freeloader because uh, they just they could do something, could they could contribute value to the group, but they're choosing to play PlayStation instead. And another person, like an elderly person who uh, really wants to help the group, but can't because they're disabled or whatever. So these are uh, the, the term freeloader probably doesn't even apply to that person so much. They're just somebody who's being taken care of by the group. Would you call your grandmother who's disabled a freeloader? I don't think you would. You know, <laughs> you might get this own. Probably individual case by case basis. Right. Yeah. So, but it's it's always the the, the number one question, and um, they, there are multiple answers to it. It's kind of like to answer that question, you have to uh, there you have to ad address multiple. So, um, okay, yeah. So we, so we can, so, yeah. So Travis said that the groups decide not to let the person in. So that, so so that goes, or they kick him out. But, um, <laughs> well, I, I really need to contextualize this a little bit. Remember, we, we we're, at, we're balancing two things. One thing is an unconditional income. This idea of a basic income has this concept of unconditional in it. Uh, if you just kick somebody out because they're not working, again, that's not unconditional. That's um, yeah, that's like a minimum wage system, basically, or something like that. Um, so, to, to answer your question, I, I usually go about it in kind of like a two-pronged approach. Um, first, as Travis said, when a group is formed, the group decides what the rules are for admitting a new members are. Similarly, and they have a voting mechanism for doing for doing this. You know, if they're going to add a new member, like joining a group is not something that's taken lightly uh, by either the person who wants to join the group or the person or the group itself. It's like joining, becoming a member of a new family or a tribe. Very serious kind of thing. They might even have you know, initiation rights, and tri Indian tribes did have initiation rights. Um, Citizenship rights. Like or, or, and in yeah, fact, we, we have that in the United States. You have to jump through a million hoops to become a United States citizen. Uh, so it's a big deal just to join a group, so, and they have a vetting process. Uh, and likewise, there's approximately maybe an equivalent amount of like effort that's involved in kicking somebody out of the group. You have to really be delinquent to get kicked out of the group, and there has to be a vote on it. That you know, this person you know, usually you don't want to just kick somebody out on a whim because they've gotten like lazy. You know, maybe they're becoming depressed. There's a good reason for their laziness, and they're not really a freeloader. They need like a medical help or something like that. Uh, it's very, very rarely the case 
that somebody is being belligerently uh, a freeloader. Um, usually there's some other problem. And the they groups, take a year or, off for their own mental well right. you know. Yeah, maybe, maybe they're burnt out. Yeah. Uh, and in that case, you just want to take care of them. Because, you know, you could be burnt out at some point. Right it's back. totally legitimate. Yeah. And they could be bounced back in the future. Like, I've yeah. experienced burnout. You know, if society just killed me off when I experienced burnout, I wouldn't be talking to you here uh, <laughs> today. So, um, so, first of all, it should be acknowledged that that is an extremely rare situation when uh, a person is being belligerently... It should be designed to be rare. I mean, I mean it's just rare in general. Um, usually, there's some legitimate reason for the, for the behavior, and the group will talk about it first. But people do get disowned from their families. People do get kicked out from tribes. These are rare situations that can happen. The group will have a mechanism for doing, for deciding that, a hearing, you know, whatever it is. And, and if it's like just maybe an ideological issue, you know, they're being oppressive, the person's free to join another group, you know. Can they join multiple groups? Uh, yes, they can join multiple groups. And in circles, there, there's there's kind of a cap on how much uh, value you can extract, even if you are a member of multiple groups. Uh, the details on, on uh, circles, but uh, on his website, on Martin's website. But um, kind of like how you can be an employee of multiple companies. Uh, yeah, you can probably be a member of multiple groups, but you know that's probably going to be taken into consideration in your application to join a group. Are you a member of another group? And this will be probably very well known. It'll be hard to hide the fact that you're a member of another group. And then they'll, you know, expect you to, but you know, you could be a member of a different group. One thing that somebody pointed out was that, you know, somebody could have income on the side or something and they could declare it to a group. One thing that's a big no-no here is having income on the side and not telling you about it. That could get you kicked out of the group. So, okay, I have, yeah. Uh, What's that? I would hear comments on that exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think we at least, at least started the answering this question, and we can go over it further offline as yeah. well. Yeah. But let's, yeah, let's, go to, let's go to the comment, and then we have some more questions over here. Right before I get to the comment, in the legitimate case, when you have outside income that you don't want to go to the group and you declare it, what you can do, you can be part of two groups, is you can have a, a smaller cup. So you can have a cup that's half the size in each group, and then that's that becomes fair. Uh, we had a comment, though. Yeah, we had a comment. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm just talking about the basic version of group income here, not the bond stuff, which I doesn't feel very much. I mean, that, that's a sort of a separate thing to talk about. Just the so, way they fund. Yeah. What's that? It's sort of like just a mechanism of funding the group. Uh, yeah, I mean that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that fits in well, but but I, I have two examples of this idea of income on the side. So. My understanding of communism in the Soviet Union is that people actually did, they, they just kind of moved all of their income off to the side. A lot of, they, they did enough work in their work groups to get by, but then they moved a lot of their stuff into the black market, into their dacha, and you know, they grew guard, you know, vegetables, and uh, you know, communism in a large part, fail. I think what happens in China now is not quite the same thing as what you would normally call communism. That's a kind of a special thing. So I, I don't. I think most people would call that a separate thing. Do you so, have a question? What's that? Do you have a question? Thank you. Thank you. A, well, it's a comment. So yeah, give, oh, it's a comment. All right. You know, by comments, it, and, 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 and yet another example in early Mormonism. Brigham Young set up some small towns in southern Utah, which were uh, the United Order. And the idea was is that, that they would be have all things in common. But it turned out that the members kind of moved a lot of their income off again. It just didn't work. People were not willing to contribute everything to the group. So I guess my comment is, you know, it's a social engineering problem. And the question is, are people going to do that? I mean, it's great to imagine. The question is, will people do it? Do we have any so, examples? Yeah, so what I like about that, and, and we can you know, try to cover this briefly because we are running on of time, is both those examples, they failed, right? I mean, along, you know, communism failed because people weren't participating, they took it off. Breaking amongst communities, they failed. This is not communism. Okay, this is not. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, yeah. So, so in the, both those examples, they failed, right? So this is that's like a it could be if you set up right, that could be a feedback mechanism. These are smaller communities, and if everyone is taking their income off, it's you know it's not going to work. I mean, you have your examples show it'll fail if everyone's hiding their income and, and and doing these these kinds of like you know black market etc. Examples you're giving. So that's the reason to you know. Um, 
discuss somebody's inclusion in the group, discuss somebody being removed from the group, et cetera. That's, that's behavior that's dangerous to the success of the group, because we know in both your examples it will fail. So it's kind of creating that feedback mechanism. Like communism, they didn't have that option, like, oh, well, China will just, we'll just shut down if, if everyone does this. And uh, so I think that feedback mechanism might help, as long as it's not too oppressive. Can you change that statement? What was the feedback mechanism? The fact that if you do do that with your income, if you do kind of take it off and out of the system, the group will fail. The group doesn't want that to happen. So they're incentivized to make sure people are reporting correctly or find ways to be better handle that. I don't, I don't know and, okay, so in, in, in other, in other, uh, uh, kind of building off of what Travis said is that um, well yeah let's let's talk about a little bit uh, just about the differences between uh, group income and something like uh, communism um, again I really need to emphasize this a lot because for whatever reason when people hear uh, about the idea of basic income they start you know throwing out these isms socialism communism no this is not this is just a way of providing people with a basic income and it's has nothing to do with uh, you know communism there there are aspects of similar ideas or desires between a basic people who want a basic income and people who want a system like communism, but the, the actual mechanism of, and what's actually going on is totally different, completely different. So the results are not going to be the same at all. It's also voluntary. So one big difference between, say, for example, what happened in Soviet Russia. And by the way, I'm Russian. I was born in the Soviet Union. My parents are both Russian, so I, I have a little bit of credibility of what I'm talking about. I, just for listening to stories of my parents, you know, and they talked about black markets as well, um, is in a communist country, uh, the, the stuff that's written on paper by Marx and the stuff that actually happens in the country in reality, they're not the same. They're very different. So in Russia, uh, power ended up getting concentrated uh, in this place called the state, and the people did not refer to the people, it referred to the people in power. So you would have uh, representatives of the people going to different uh, towns and saying, give us your milk, it belongs to the people. The people was understood not to refer to the people in the village or to the people who were producing the milk, but to the people back home in Moscow, you know, or something like that. And then they decided what to do with actually the milk. And there was social stratification uh, you know, it wasn't at all that people were equal. You know, you were a member of the Communist Party, and the closer you were as a friend to Stalin or Lenin at the time, the you know the kind of more important, higher social status you were. In many ways, it was very similar to fascism. Um, you know, and that's that operated on a big difference was that it operated on the country of hundreds of millions of people. What we're talking about here, like literally, these groups can be eight people in size. One of the big reasons why communism in Soviet Russia failed was because, again, the, the, the groups were not really in aligned in terms of incentives. You had these people uh, in Moscow making decisions on behalf of people they did not know by name at all. They'd never seen their faces. They did not know what their problems were. And this is a problem that's not unique to communism. It's a problem that occurs in any ism where you have a centralized governing authority uh, that's uh, you know making decisions on behalf of people that they don't know anything about their lives. You always run into these kinds of problems. It's a lot more difficult for that situation to happen when you're talking about like your family or your extended family. Uh, yes, did you have a question? Yeah. So this would look like you know, small groups as opposed to very large groups. So if you used to figure out a mechanism by which small groups are better. How do you link those to have a rate of Yeah, so, so the, that's, that's group currency and circles. You, you should look into circles. So the question is, um, it, it works when you have small groups and you have a currency. How do you link the currencies together? Was that, was that the question? Yeah, but each currency, you should think, people don't each Yeah, yeah. Like the question is sort of like how would these groups work together if they don't like each other? Yeah. I mean, I definitely encourage you to look at uh, circles model as well as Greg was saying, and, and you could even just say there's like an exchange rate element going on. Um, yeah, well, in circles, groups can actually, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, in circles, uh, individuals can trust each other to exchange one-to-one, -one, and groups can uh, choose to trust each other. In, in that case, are they exchanging one-to-one? -one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, if there's no trust, you don't, you don't exchange one-to-one. -one. Maybe you exchange one-to-one. -one. 
It sounds like you're <clears throat> taking the country's now to issue currencies. And it sounds like what you're saying is take that to a more decentralized mode where you do have transparency in terms of the blockchain, but it can go to smaller groups. So in a sense, essentially, it sounds to me like individuals or groups like this or academia or anyone could create a group currency that is somehow exchanged with other groups. Yeah, that's, it, that's the idea behind it. Like, yeah, currency is like, we have value, we're going to do something good, we create our own currency, and right. we have value. If all those guys over there are gang members and don't want any bad things, their currency is not going to be so valuable. That's what I mean. It'll, it's, that right? trying, that's what I was trying to say earlier. I think if I described it very well, I was trying to say earlier in response to Christian's question was, you know, the group will fail if they have bad, if they're set up wrong, if they're not, you know, behaving correctly, the group's going to fail. And yeah, so there's strong, strong incentives within uh, productive groups to be productive, yeah. etc., will be very valued and in demand, and more people want to be. So, uh, yes. okay. um, so another important aspect that's covered on the group currency website about this is that uh, there is a, a feedback mechanism between the group and the market as a whole, and that's the price of the group's token. So if the market thinks the group is doing a bad job, they just don't buy, they, they are able to devalue the worth of a particular group's token, right. and then that group won't be able to provide themselves with basic income. So there's a huge incentive factor here for groups to be well behaved. So yeah, we've been waiting the longest. Yeah. yeah. Um, I found it interesting that uh, I said when basic income uh, will not work in San Francisco because of uh, housing was on that. So I suspect uh, uh, this will happen in other regions too. There will be other bottlenecks, uh, and uh, basic income will not work. Uh, the easiest example is when Earth becomes more popular in the area. Yeah, uh, if it be the question, what you're saying, yeah, that statement is is this idea that group can, income can't work in San Francisco, and there's a very real chance that'll happen elsewhere. And even extrapolating to say, you know, one day you know, the Earth's overpopulated and it won't work here. Yeah, it, 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 it's still very important because you can have San Francisco. Everyone's going to it for a reason. It's this economic hub. It has this money, and you can still participate. And in fact, it's really incentivized to participate because it's having this influx of people. And if you live in San Francisco and you want a basic income, you might feel like cheated. You can't have it here. What it's doing though is it's saying, if you move, <laughs> we'll, we'll supply one for you. You know, no problem. There's all these sort of pilot cities and all these regions we support, all these groups we support. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's very incentivized. And hopefully, that kind of helps try to control. Right now, we have this crazy trend where all populations moving more and more towards cities, and whether that's sustainable or not is quite the question. But my question is, what will happen uh, when the Earth becomes so yeah. very I'll play with that. Okay, so the question is, uh, Back to Star Trek. yeah, yeah. Let, 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 let's let's do a thought experiment. Of what happens? You know, uh, imagine the Earth is overpopulated, and what uh, happens in terms of basic income in that situation? Let's simplify it a little bit and say that the Earth is overpopulated and it is homogeneously distributed in terms of human population. So uh, we have basically like people standing side by side like this anywhere there is land. Uh, what happens in that situation? Well, all that happens, you know, remember. For a basic income to exist, there has to be, rule number one, sufficient value um, to provide a basic income. Let's say that this planet, people standing side by side like this, is somehow able to produce sufficient value. Uh, well, we can imagine a lot of different scenarios where this would actually work. So let's say we're standing side by side like this, but instead of just standing here and breathing the air, we're actually inside of tubes, kind of like in the Matrix. And we're not really interacting with the world around us, we're kind of in suspended animation, and uh, we're interacting with the matrix. Uh, yes, that world would be able to provide uh, itself. It would it be able a lot of motivation yeah. to pay people to go somewhere else as well. Like, like well huge, to a different planet. It's a huge economic driver to colonize Mars in that yeah. situation. And, and, and that's just the will and the want. Of if they're not inside of uh, you know regenerative tubes, um, then their quality of life is probably going to go uh, really down. And what will happen is that the definition of what basic is changes. So right now, basic you know might mean a roof over your head. But when everybody's packed in like sardines, that might not there might not be enough place to put wood to have a roof over your head. So basic might mean that in that case you know maybe it could be a mechanism that creates economic drivers yeah. to you know encourage people to go elsewhere. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Kind of. It's a fun hypothetical. It's, yeah. Uh, I also wanted to make a comment that if we uh, take care of the basic income before we get to the point where everybody's getting like this, then Timmy will have the premium of thought to create the program that will never end up in that. Oh, okay. So, so the comment is an excellent one, which is that if Timmy has the freedom, thanks to a basic income, to create value like the Warp Drive and whatnot, hopefully we will never run across the situation where we're facing the situation where we're packed with certain and can't. Martin, Martin had a comment. Who yeah, here? I think we had a question in the back yeah. earlier. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. What is the minimum number of uh, English groups in your design? The minimum number for a group? Um, well, okay. The point of these groups. Okay, so the question is, what is the, well, what is the, what is the minimum number uh, for creating a group here? Uh, the answer is, you have to consider what is the point of having a group in the first place. So somebody like uh, Warren Buffett could create a group of one person. He's got so much in the bank that he can provide himself with basic income just fine. <laughs> the point of creating these groups is to provide the members with the basic income and to, oh, I remember what you put that, by the way, oh, and okay. the, the lending clubs, the predatory stuff we've been talking about. Oh, I crossed that off. Okay. Um, is, is to provide group members with the basic income. So if the group is of size two and it's able to provide its members with the basic income, then it's succeeded at its task. So it could be as small as two. Uh, you have a question. So just to clarify, in a group income situation, you're actually not able to handle the case where people are providing non-taxable value, right? No, we are. We most certainly are. The question is, in the, in the, group, uh, in the group income example, are you able to handle the situation where somebody is providing non-monetizable value? No, we most certainly are. And that's, that's kind of like, you know, one of the ideas and the reasons for having a basic income is to be able to have these people on earth who are doing good things that aren't monetizable uh, and have them survive and be happy and to be able to continue to not be like stressed and to be able to continue to create value that's not monetizable. As long as, as long as their group is being helped yeah. out and there'll be investors and people who care, people buying bonds or doing sure. tracking. But that value is never recognized. No, it is. It's sure. a sum of the greater parts kind of thing. So, 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 yeah. so, maybe I just consider two stories. But so basically, at the end of every month, my jar is going to be filled, assuming I'm, I'm someone who produces non monetizable value, because other people will produce monetized value that they brought into the group. And if we're doing like this uh, tracking type thing, it'll say that, oh, you know, I owe $100 or whatever because I didn't bring in any money. I'm never going to kicked out of this group because people understand yeah. that I bring value to the group. Right. But on paper, it looks like I owe the group some fantastic sum that I can never pay back. Even if I do start providing it's not, paper, paper, paper. it's not technically on paper, it's in the cloud. It's not technically on paper, it's in the cloud. That's making a joke. <laughs> yeah. um, and your question or concern is, yes, yes, you, you would be in a situation where in the cloud or on paper, it looks like uh, you, this is why we don't have the word debt really, we, we call it a tracking system. There are going to be members in the groups that are very valuable to the group, and they help the group increase the amount of income that the group gets. Uh, but they are not able to directly uh, monetize their value. Like so, for, like it's it's fine. If you'll have this big number. Yeah, but there's no. It's stigma. totally fine. There's no stigma, stigma attached to it. Yeah, as long as you know, like, they know that the reason why they're all doing so well is because of people like you in the group, and it's yeah. like it's cool. Yeah, sure. But at the point where I start maybe doing something else that does have monetary value, I'm suddenly in a giant hole. I mean, unless the rest of the group has some mechanism and some procedure to say, oh, we should wipe this out. This isn't real. That, that could really oh, that, that, that's actually up to the group, yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, that's a very reasonable uh, thing to do. Yeah, especially if there's no statement so, so, so there's, there's a rule to that, right. just making it a real mechanism. The situation described was, yeah. what if this, there's this person who's providing non-monetizable high value to the group, uh, but then all of a sudden they get a job or whatever, and they're able to um, monetize the value that they're, the new value that they're creating, the different value that they're creating. Um, are they going to be in a big hole because they've uh, been creating non-monetizable value for three years and now 